going on mate? It's Cashew, and I want to talk about a very overlooked part of the Borderlands game. The opening stage slash tutorial segments. This is the segment at the very beginning of the game. It is responsible for teaching you how to play, introducing you to the story, and setting the overall tone for the adventure. This part of each game is way more important than most people realise, as Borderlands games are now sold on their replayability, and there is no part of the game you're going to have to do more times than the start. For this reason, ideally, the tutorial segment won't waste time, be filled with a lot of moment to moment gameplay and be easy to get through while still being pretty fun. So without further ado, let's get into the first one with Bo Borderlands 1 had a lot to prove when it first released, being the first game of its kind, the looter shooter. Therefore, since players weren't really used to how the game would operate, Borderlands 1 chose to ease the player into it. Over like three hours. Yeah, I keep it no secret that I really dislike the opening of Borderlands 1. I get the feeling that Firestone was without a doubt the first thing the team worked on, because you can feel the game evolving, getting more fun and in depth the later you are into the game's story, but at the beginning, it just kind of sucks. You first start off being greeted by Claptrap, who then gets you to walk in a straight line to a pole, fight your way through some bandits, and rescue the single resident Firestone, Dr. Z. This is not bad, a little slow, but it's fine. The problems only start to arise with how the quests work and the hub you're given to do them in. If you're just doing the main story with no side quests, you run out of Firestone, kill some skags, run back to Zed, run out of Firestone to grab a battery, run back to Zed, shield tutorial, run out of Firestone, kill some bandits, run back to Zed, run out of Firestone, meet TK Baja, run around to get TK Baja some food, run back to Firestone, grenade tutorial, run back to TK Baja, kill nine toes, run back to Firestone. And keep in mind, running between each of these places takes about 20 seconds to a minute, which might not seem like that much from just hearing it, but the time adds up and before you know it, you've spent more time doing absolutely nothing than running to objective markers than actually playing the game. From starting up the game to killing 9 toes, it's going to take you about 20 minutes, with most of that time just being running around. But that's not the full tutorial segment done. Though the game does open up a lot more after this point, you're still far from what you play BL1 for. Next, the game gets you to tackle Bonehead, who is a way higher level than you, which then leads the player to learn the value of side quests. But after you kill Bonehead and fix the catcher ride, you get a car tutorial, further opening up the map and more side quests. You then start a long fetch quest to take on Sledge at Headstone Mine. First, you go to a house that you're told has the mine's gate key in it, but you find out it's been moved to another location, which is at the very end of a different map, and is way higher level than you, so you're gonna have to start grinding more side quests. After you're finally on level and get the key, you're ready for headstone mine, and as Angel puts it, the first real challenge of the game, Sledge. One final boss before you're allowed to play Borderlands 1 for real is what I would say if you got to go straight to New Haven after beating Sledge, but instead you do a car combat tutorial, Flight Mad Mel, which is probably the pinnacle of boss design, I mean, no one's beating this. What the fuck is going on? And then you finally get to go to New Haven, the main hub of the game, where you can finally start Borderlands 1 for real. I don't know if including Mad Mel in the car stuff as part of the tutorial segment is a hot take or not, but in any case, Borderlands 1 doesn't really get on its feet until you reach New Haven. My main issue with this segment is how long it is, taking about two and a half hours if you're just straight gunning for New Haven. It teaches you the game's mechanics well enough, but damn if it isn't boring. Let's just hope they improve this for Borderlands... Borderlands 2's tutorial segment is done very well. It depends on who you ask, but I'd call everything from the start of the game to getting to Sanctuary as part of this segment. Same with Borderlands 1, with getting to the main hub of the game and getting the story properly started. But that's the key difference between these two games. Borderlands 2's story is on full display right from the beginning, with your goal being clearly outlined from the start, get to Sanctuary. You start off by meeting Claptrap, walking in a straight line, getting a gun, then making your way down a linear path to reach the game's first boss, Knuckle Dragon. You then reach Liesberg, which is your main introduction to mobbing, and for now, your main antagonist, Captain Flint. You then get a shield, learn about them, and shortly after, you get your first grenade mods from Boom and Boom, the next boss. Of course, before that though, the first side quests of the game open up, teaching you about optional objectives and area waypoints. But yeah, all that's left is to fight your way through Flint's bandit camp, and then fight the big man himself, who is complete bullshit for an early game boss. Up to this point, the only elemental weapons available are fire, and Flint is completely immune. Speaking of immune, Flint will go into his fire phase where he is completely engulfed in flames and reflects bullets while the boss arena is covered in fire. It's impossible to damage by normal means while they're in this state, apart from splash damage, so your best bet is to wait it out. Flint is a big difficulty spike for sure, but works in the same way as Sledge, beating one final hard boss to unlock the rest of the game. After you beat him and board Claptrap ship, you'll learn about area waypoints, again, side objectives, again, and get a car tutorial, before finally getting to Sanctuary and starting the game's story off proper. This is a huge improvement over the first game, having two linear segments bookending the tutorial with the sudden shelf acting as an open area in between for side quests. 
It teaches you the basics and gets you ready for the game ahead, but what's so great about it is how it rewards your replayability. If you've played the game for a long time, you will learn about Legendary, some of the best items in the game that usually have a 5 or 10% drop chance from specific bosses. And in that tutorial segment alone, there are four. The Hornet from Knuckle Dragger, the Kablaster from Mitchmong, who is an optional boss if you choose to do all the side quests available, the bonus package from Boom Boom, and the Thunderball Fist from Flint. Being able to farm these makes your new playthroughs feel more fresh and new, as you're still discovering new things even after you beat the game. The third playthrough mode of the game, Ultimate Vault Hunter mode, also speeds up the process of the tutorial segment by starting you right at the beginning of Liarsburg instead of having to wait through all of Claptrap's dialogue and make your way to Knuckle Dragger. So all in all, Ball and Sue's tutorial segment teaches the player well and keeps them entertained with new things to do constantly, not wasting any time and rewarding those who play it over and over. Let's hope they can continue this streak with Borderlands the Prince. Pre-sequel starts off with a bang, as the new Vault Hunters answer Handsome Jack summons to Helio Station while it's under attack from the Lost Legion. It's so explosive, even when the game is teaching you mechanics, you're never too far away from the gameplay or the story. Which is another good thing about this segment. The story starts right away. You'll not sell it like BO1 or 2 while you get on your feet, you're dropped right into where the story starts and pick up the pieces as you go. The first thing you're brought to is a short combat section to get the feel for how the game plays. Then you'll go on to meet Handsome Jack, who's getting the crap kicked out. After you save him from the Lost Legion, you'll get a reviving tutorial that was never included in the other Borderlands games. Jack will then give you your first shield as a quest reward and explains how they work the best out of any other Borderlands game. Alright, looks like you got a shield. Pretty self-explanatory, really. It leads bullets until it depletes. When it does, you gotta hide and give it time to recharge. You then make your way through the station, trying to find a way to escape. While doing so, your character will most likely reach level 3, which is the new level you unlock your action skill at instead of 5 like in the other two games. This gives you a safe space to test it out in and keeps the segment fresh as it builds upon the mechanics you use. In the next room, you'll get your first mini boss. So like Nine Toes or Knuckle Dragger, but this time, it's way better. Introducing the pinnacle of the Borderlands franchise, Flame Knuckle! He's a Fire Lost Legion mech and he's really hot. I mean cute. I mean fuck. I mean He's a Fire Lost Legion mech and for some reason he's already damaged when you get into the fight. After you destroy his power suit, he will then hop out of it and fight you on foot. A pretty easy boss, all things considered, due to their easy to hit crit spots. And I know you might be drawing parallels to Flint in your mind, thinking, why was Flint so hard but Flame Knuckle is so easy if they're both fire? Well, Flame Knuckle doesn't have any annoying immunity phases and is also a boss before you have any access to a fire gun anyways. So their immunity to it does not matter. Flame Knuckle, like I said before, also has really easy to hit crit spots while Flint definitely did not. Moving on, you'll find a way up the elevator while Mordecai throws shade at BO1's intro, which is nice. This is kind of exciting. Yeah, our story just began with us getting off a bus. This sounds all explosive and stuff. Then do a quick melee tutorial and get sent to Pandora's Moon. Help it. Oh, after we killed this arsehole. Okay, now we can go to the moon. So far, the tutorial segment for pre sequel hasn't been too different from the others besides the higher focus on story. Last thing, a brisk 16 or so minutes. But now that we're on the moon, you're going to have to learn about zero gravity mechanics. You'll first start off by following Janie Springs so you can get used to the floatier movement of a vacuum. Springs then tasks you to get an Oz kit, which is in a building not so far away. As you head there, you'll hopefully notice that there are a lot of oxygen cracks in the ground, as well as enemies and piles having a lot of oxygen stashed. After you secure your Oz kit, you'll get a tutorial teaching you how to use its boost, slam, and returning to the ground immediately moves. Jenny will then task you with killing Deadlift, your first real challenge, like Sledge and Flint. But I warn you, do not fight Deadlift unprepared. You might be able to get away with it with the other two, but this guy is stupid annoying. This is because, like the other games, they want you to learn the value of doing side quests, as Janie's side quests here have some really good early game Oz kits, like the Invigoration Oz kit that heals you every time you pick up an oxygen canister. I also recommend farming a grounded shield before fighting Deadlift, yes, even in normal mode, because like how Flint was fire-based in Borderlands, Deadlift is all about shock, and a grounded shield will make you immune to shock damage. Deadlift's fight does two things. Make you and teach you how jump pads work. The jump pads, while fun, are one of the many reasons this fight is so annoying. He's always moving around, making them hard to hit while they throw really strong electric balls at you. They're also immune to shock damage, which isn't that bad until you realize that the main chunk of this fight is just getting rid of their shield. The best strategy is to slam next to him over and over while shooting his crit, being their backpack or their head. And after the shield's gone, he's basically already dead. He can also do this really annoying move where he electrifies the floor of an entire area. But if you picked up a grounded shield, it won't matter, you'll be fine. After you kill Deadlift, 
left, he is guaranteed to drop the Vandergraffen, which is the first laser you'll see in the game and will be your first chance to try out the new gun type. Just past there, you'll get access to the moon zoomies and the surrounding color tutorial, and you'll be able to make it to the main hub of the game, Concordia. And that's the tutorial segment of pre-sequel. I think it starts off good and really keeps up the pace, but slows down a little too much for my liking the closer you get to deadlift. As good as it is though, I will say that it does lack the replayability factor BO2 had. I mean, it's still fun and doesn't waste your time, which is all you really need. But in the way of farmable drops, there's a knowledge check. There are three, and two of them are from overleveled secret bosses. So that just leaves one left, being the Nukem dropping from Flame Knuckle. In normal mode, it is a 1 in 10 drop chance, but in TVHM and UVHM, it's a 1 in 3. This is because Helio Station is a map that you can't return to. It is tutorial only, which actually means on replay in TVHM, if you're not lucky enough to score the 1 in 3, you will have no guns to farm besides the regular ones you get from side quests. All in all though, it's not bad, with it only taking about 40 minutes to get to Concordia from the beginning of the game. Well, I guess that just leaves Borderlands 3. Borderlands 3's well, tutorial is honestly really great for a first playthrough. Anything after that, it's like pulling teeth. And that's because of the amount of dialogue present during this part. It starts off with dialogue and a few simple button presses before you get to the tutorial that teaches you about sliding and mantling. You're then greeted with a minute long unskippable cutscene that has Claptrap dance around pretending to sneak. I'll admit I found it kind of funny on my first playthrough, but damn if it doesn't get old fast. You're then given your first gun and are shown that some guns now have alternate shooting modes. And some guns now include an alternate shooting mode. And I'll say it right now, the Malogo is probably the most fun first gun you get from any Borderlands game. The Zip Rockets are a great first alternate mode to get, and the gun overall just feels really solid. You won't get to use it for a while though, you'll need to sit through some more dialogue before the door is opened and you can start the first combat encounter of the game. This area is awesome though, it shows you destructible cover, new barrel mechanics, and has a really good flow to it while you just try out sliding and mantling for the first time in a fighting scenario. After you clear out the area, you're told to find a shield and then it's onto your first boss. Shit, this guy's a complete pushover. All you really need to do is hit one barrel at them, shoot them a bit, and they're dead. Now that that's over and done with, Lilith will spawn in and give you a few grenades for you to try out on an incoming bandit horde. At this point, you probably have unlocked your action skill as well to test out on these guys. But before the game opens up a bit more, you'll have to overcome another challenge. Listening to Lilith's dialogue. Now that you've cleared out the camp, you'll get access to the first open area in Borderlands 3, the Droughts. There immediately will be a few side quests available and a lot of optional challenges that you can find that rewards your exploration. I really enjoy this area when I play. I enjoy almost everything apart from the actual main story, which insists on taking its time to do a whole lot of not that much. From rescuing Vaughn, whose character is completely different from the last game he was in, or the absolutely iconic part where you meet Tannis and the game literally just tells you to fuck around the loot for a few minutes while she exposits stuff that isn't really that important. Stuff like this really drags on as you just want to get to the main part of the game, but there's just so much more to be done. You'll meet Ellie and you'll get the car tutorial as well as a side quest that teaches you about red chests and optional objectives. After all that, you'll be tasked with traveling to Ascension Bluff where you'll fight through the Holy Broadcast Center and fight Mouthpiece, who really isn't that hard. As you've seen from earlier in the video, the second main boss is usually quite a difficulty spike and serves as your first real challenge. But like Shiv before him, Mouthpiece is a pushover. The only way someone would really struggle on them is if they were extremely underleveled and still were using like the starting pistol for some reason. The only thing left to do is to get fuel for Sanctuary 3 so you can leave Pandora, which is pretty mindless and doesn't really teach you anything. When you return, there is a twist and the Calypso twins steal Lilith's siren powers and you have to fight your way to her. After you do that, you get a quick reviving tutorial, which would be pretty redundant at this point, so not really a tutorial. And then Sanctuary 3, the main hub, is unlocked, and with that, the tutorial segment is complete. As good as it is, considering how well it teaches the player new mechanics, this is my second least favorite tutorial segment, as, like BO1, it takes a ever to complete. On replay, the heavy dialogue makes getting through it a challenge. And the saving grace of the droughts for me being its exploration definitely loses its touch after you know you've already discovered it. But with all this being said, Borderlands 3 added a feature with the release of one of the campaign DLCs that allows you to skip the entire tutorial segment and spawn in at Sanctuary at level 13. This is a cool as fuck move. And I'll admit, it's a lot more of trying to help new players play the new DLC as soon as possible, more than wanting to let the 
players skip the entire tutorial segment, but we take those. <laughs> and honestly, I think that after you beat the story for the first time in every Borderlands game, you should be able to skip the tutorial segments, as they really don't have that much unique gameplay to offer outside of that first playthrough. Borderlands 3's tutorial segment really falls apart in the way of replayability, mainly because of its legendaries. The problem is not like pre-sequel, where basically there are none. It's actually the opposite. There are just way too many. There's never going to be a time in the modern day playing Borderlands 3 where you do not just get every legendary first try. It doesn't really give you that much variety, seeing as you'll just probably get nearly every legendary first try, making the game super easy as a result. And those were all of the tutorial segments in Borderlands. And I know what you're thinking, what about Wonderlands? <laughs> No. Doing this video was honestly pretty cool. Getting to see what each game did better and worse, while also discovering there's definitely a formula being used here. From spawn in, short combat segment, easy boss, side quests, and long gameplay segment, to one last hard boss before the game really opens up. And if I had to rank them worst to best, it'd go Borderlands 1, Borderlands 3, Borderlands 2, and finally, Borderlands the pre-sequel, because I am biased. I'd be interested to see how other people would rank them though, so let me know in the comments. But thanks for watching, if you want my eternal gratitude for 1-3 to three weeks, consider subscribing, and mate, I'll see you next time. But hey, before the video ends, just gotta shout out my channel members. They are JBH, who won a boxing tournament by finding a loophole in the rules that lets you put horseshoes in your gloves as long as you're wearing a fedora. They're, um, really outdated rules. <laughs> Whisk520, who knows what you did last night, and frankly, they're not impressed. Angel B, who was invited to the HPBBI, being the Holy People Battle Brawl Invitational to do battle with all the religious figures the world has conceived. It's usually an honour just to be included, but for them, come on, they knew it was coming. And Chimmy Scrimpy, who did not rob a bank in 86. I don't know why people keep saying that. But thank you guys so much for showing the extra support. I really appreciate you guys. If you also want to become a channel member, join buttons right below the video. But thank you for watching, and maybe just subscribe, maybe? Ah, see ya.